بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه بسم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته just want to say Jazakallah khair to brothers in need for giving me this opportunity to be here tonight. You know, it's a great honour and a great privilege, alhamdulillah, to, you could say, represent our sisters here, inshallah, with um, ta'ala. Dear sisters and brothers, what I want to speak about tonight, inshallah, is about how we can bring about positive change in our marriage by focusing on having ihsan in the way that we deal with our spouse, and the way that we treat our spouse, inshallah. Because one of the root causes that we find behind so many of the problems that we see happening in our marriages today is that, you know, we tend to get so used to each other, we tend to start taking each other, for, you know, for granted. And what happens is that we, we, we think less and less about the way we treat each other. You know, get over the first few days of the honeymoon stage, give it a few years, and you find that, subhanAllah, as time goes by, slowly, slowly, we start to take each other more and more for granted. And we start to, you know, we get to a point where, you know, we even it just expect our spouse, you know, to basically put up with us no matter what we say or do. We just expect them to, 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 to keep loving us the same and put up with us just the same. And this is probably one of the biggest mistakes that we all tend to make. We all easily fall into this mistake. Um, so subhanAllah, sisters and, and brothers, you know, the reality is that, you know, marriage is very much like a garden. You cannot, just like you cannot, you know, leave your garden. You, you need to nurture the garden, you need to water the garden, you need to take care of the garden. Similarly, a marriage is exactly the same. You need to keep investing in the marriage. You know, it's not something you can just do in the early days and forget all about it and just rely on the happy memories you had in the beginning of your marriage. It's a constant, you know, thing that we may need to be focusing on. Otherwise, what happens to the marriage? It basically wilts and fades away. This is what happens, subhanAllah, just like the garden. Um, you know, we need to ask ourselves, how is it, first of all, how is it that Khadija radiallahu anha wa abaha was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and yet, even years after she's passed away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he can never forget about her. He never stops mentioning her. To the level that Aisha radiallahu anha, she says about her that subhanAllah, there was, there was no other woman that I was more jealous of than Khadija radiallahu anha, and yet she hadn't even seen her, subhanAllah. And you know, he would, he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would be, you know, he kept on saying, you know, she believed in me when all of the people just believed in me. She supported me with her wealth when all of the people were depriving me. You know, and we've got to ask ourselves, what is the main reason why he never forgot about her? What is the main reason why, you know, she made such a huge impact on his heart? And of course, the main reason after her complete iman, Allah Azza wa Jal, was her beautiful manners and her beautiful treatment of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is why you know Subhanallah, he could never stop mentioning her. And like I said, it was like her memory was imprinted upon his heart, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Even just seeing one of her old necklaces years later will bring tears to his eyes, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, and the scholars mentioned about Khadija radiallahu. Why she'll be given, from the reasons why she'll be given this special reward in Al-Jannah of, you know, of, this, of the house of Qasab, of this house of hollowed out pearl in which la sahaba fihi wa la nasab, that there's no disturbance in this house and there's no fatigue in this house. What is the reason why she'll be given this special reward in Al-Jannah? They said it's due to her beautiful manners. It's due to her beautiful manners and character that she had with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that not even one day, they said, not even one day in her life, SubhanAllah, did she ever cause the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to feel sad or to feel disturbed by something that she said or did. Radiallahu anha wa So this is how Khadija, radiallahu anha, she knew how to capture the heart of her husband by her beautiful manners and treatment of him. And similarly, sisters and brothers, we need to ask ourselves, 
How is it that the Prophet ﷺ was able to have nine wives? Each of them, they had completely different personalities and characters. And yet, he's able to maintain a peaceful and happy marriage with every single one of them. And each one of those wives feels completely satisfied and loved by their husband, uh, the Prophet ﷺ. And what is the answer? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he was the master in khuluq. He was the master in manners. And he knew how to use his beautiful manners in order to nurture the love in the heart of his wife. You know, subhanAllah, some people, they try to criticize Islam and they try to criticize the fact that the Prophet ﷺ had so many wives. Yet how many men do we see, you know, today that they only have one wife and yet they're not able to even make one wife feel satisfied and loved in the way that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ felt so loved and satisfied by the Prophet ﷺ. And sisters and brothers, if you look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, we see how the Prophet ﷺ, he used to make use of even the smallest situations to nurture that love in the heart of his wife. No matter how long he's been married to her, it's not something that's happened in the early days. Even years later, this, is, this, is, this was his mission, always trying to nurture that love in the heart of his wife. Because, you know the reason why? Because just like he would pray and make rukur and make sujud to get close to Allah, he used to seek nearness to Allah through striving to bring happiness to the heart of his wife through his beautiful akhlaq and treatment of her. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he understood that having ihsan and striving for the akhirah, it's not just through your prayers and fasting. Having ihsan and striving for the akhirah is not just through your prayers and fasting. It's not just, you know, an, the outward clothes we wear, like putting on an abaya or a naqab or growing our beards, all these things. Rather, ihsan and striving for the akhirah, my dearest sisters and brothers, is also in your way of dealing and treating others, especially when it comes to the spouse, especially when it comes to your spouse, subhanAllah. It's something we, we neglect so much. Yani outside, you know, subhanAllah, we're very careful with people not to offend them, not to say something wrong. But as I said before, sadly, we all tend to fall into this where the one we take for granted the most is the one who needs our ihsan the most. And this is why we find that, you know, whenever the Prophet ﷺ would enter his house, subhanAllah, he'd actually bring happiness into the house with him. And he would make it his aim to bring happiness to the hearts of those inside the house. As soon as he, you know, enters the home, you find that, look at, look at, look at the way he thinks. From the very first moment he enters the home, the first thing he thinks to do is to go and, you know, brush his, his teeth with a miswak. What is the reason? Because he's so sensitive to the level, he doesn't want anyone in his household to smell even the slightest bad odour from him, sallallahu alayhi wa And you know, Aisha says that, you know, when he would enter the home, the first thing he would do, he'll start with, you know, helping his family with whatever they're doing. And that, you know, he would mend his own shoes, his, his own clothes, things like that. He'll be doing just normal things inside the house. And that he never thought, he never felt that that's beneath him. Despite his the Prophet وسلم, he never felt that he's putting himself down by doing those things. Rather, he was happy to do that. He's happy to, you know, help his family or to just be a normal person inside his house. Because why? Because he knew that, you know, doing even the smallest acts of kindness, doing even the smallest acts of ihsan and bringing happiness to the hearts of those around you, this is from the things that brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the things that brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we see that, you know, however, you know, whenever he would sit with his wives, he would make use of even the smallest situations to nurture that love in their hearts. Even the smallest situations, subhanAllah, he wouldn't let that go. You know, Aisha radiallahu anha, she tells us how she would, you know, eat or, you know, drink with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would would make her drink before him because she'd feel shy to, to drink before him from her great respect for him. So he would swear by Allah that she has to drink before him. 
And so she would take a drink from the cup and then he will turn the cup to place his mouth on the same place where she placed her mouth. SubhanAllah. This is, what, what's the reason why he's doing this? He wants to nurture that love and show her the love that he has. Did that cost money, sisters and brothers? Did that cost money? SubhanAllah. Did that take time? Look how simple is these actions of the Prophet wasallam. You know, forget about reading, you know, romance novels like Julie, you know, Romeo and Juliet. That's nothing in comparison to, you know, to the, the romantic actions of our beloved Prophet wasallam. Even, you know, when she takes, for example, a, a bite from uh, some meat, the same thing, he'll turn the, the meat and eat from the same place on the bone as Aisha radiallahu anha. So this is how sensitive the Prophet wasallam was to the feelings of his wife and how he would make use of even the simplest situations to nurture that love. And, yet, and the other thing too is that we, we find that despite how busy the Prophet ﷺ was, you know, he's the leader of the Ummah, he's the master of the Ummah, but yet he never saw it as too small or too trivial to make time for his wife. He never thought that that's something too small or too trivial to do, to sit with his wife, to talk with his wife, to laugh with his wife, to spend quality time with his wife. Why do you think he stood there so long while Aisha radiallahu anha is looking, you know, she's looking at the Ethiopians playing in the masjid with their spears. Do you think he really was interested to watch that in the Eid? He, no. He, but he's standing there for her sake. Even it's mentioned that he's changing from foot to foot because, you know, subhanAllah, but, but why is he standing there? Because he knows it's something that's bringing happiness to the heart of his wife. So this is how he would... You know, it, it, he never thought that's too small. The same way that he'd get close to Allah through his prayers and his fasting, that he's trying to get close to Allah by bringing that happiness to the heart of his wife. Okay, so from sisters and brothers, from one of the greatest lessons that we learn from the life of the Prophet wasallam is that if you want to have a happy marriage, if you truly want to have a happy marriage, it's not about how much money you have. And it's not about how beautiful your house is, and it's not about being able to go on fancy holidays, subhanAllah. You know, what's it all about? It's about focusing on doing the simple things, not overlooking doing the simple things. And from those things in particular is dealing with each other with the beautiful manners and dealing with each other with ihsan. That's how simple it gets. And you know, before I finish, I just want to share with you basically three tips from the sunnah that if you stick to these three things, inshallah, they will help you to bring about positive change, inshallah, in your marriage. So the first one is the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which he tells us, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, falyakul khayran aw yasmut. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him say the good or to remain silent. So subhanAllah, if you think about just this hadith, imagine if all of us, could just put this hadith into action in our homes. Just this one hadith. Imagine if all we do is to focus on saying only positive words and words that nurture the heart between ourselves and our spouses. You know, this is, the, this is unfortunately what we, we tend to always focus on the negative and criticism and put each other down and nagging and these things. And we forget about focusing more on praising our spouse, you know, thanking our spouse, you know, telling our spouse how much we love them and appreciate them, even just reflecting back to our spouse what we like about our spouses. We forget so many times to do that, subhanAllah. We're all guilty of this. You know, and avoiding those words that hurt the, your spouse's heart. You know that that word's going to hurt your spouse's heart when you say it. Things that make your, your, your spouse feel put down when you say it. So we have to realise that it's the bad words and the bad manners, my dearest sisters and brothers. The bad words and the bad manners, this is the main cause for the love to be destroyed in the heart of your spouse. It just takes one word, you know, one word to leave the tongue and you don't know what kind of destruction that word can cause. And once the word goes, you, you know, you can't bring it back. You know, you can say sorry, you can say forgive me, but sometimes it can hurt so badly in a person's heart, it can stab more deeper and hurt a person more than had they been stabbed with a knife, as you know, subhanAllah. So that's why, 
You know, before a word leaves our tongue, we really should be asking ourselves three questions. You know, even when you're angry, ask yourself these three questions. Is it really worth it? Is it really necessary? Is it really kind? Is it kind to say? If, it's, if you can't answer yes to all three, then hold that word and, and don't say it. The second advice I'd like to share in Shola tonight is, you know, when you have an argument with your spouse, the hadith that's always helped me, you know, alhamdulillah, in my, in my marriage, with my, you know, when I've had arguments, we all have arguments, let's admit it. I'm not going to get up here and say I'll never have an argument with my husband, all right? But, you know, subhanAllah, the hadith that's always helped me is the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he tells us that I guarantee a place in al-Jannah for the one who gives up arguing, even if they're right. I guarantee a place in al-Jannah who gives, for the one who gives up arguing, even if they're right. This is probably one of the best, or this is probably one of the best lessons that I have learned. You know, alhamdulillah, I've been married to my husband now for over 27 years, min fadlillah. And what I can tell you from this experience is that fighting and arguing is simply not worth it. That's what it comes down to. Fighting and arguing is simply not worth it. And that's why I'm saying that this hadith helped me so much to overcome this because you know, if you think about this hadith, what's this hadith teaching you? It's teaching you that the winner of an argument is not the person who has the last word. The winner of the argument is the one who can swallow their pride and they choose Jannah over winning that trivial argument. You're basically choosing Jannah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over trying to win that trivial argument. And as you know, the saddest thing is about half the arguments we have they're over the most ridiculous things. And all arguing does ultimately, my dearest sisters and brothers, is it, all it's going to do is destroy your marriage and it basically puts out the love. It basically puts out the love in the heart of your, your husband or your wife. Okay, and then lastly, the last advice that I'd like to share in Shalat tonight is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he says, Inna rifqa la yakunu fi shay'in illa zanahu that verily gentleness is not in anything except it beautifies it and it's not removed from anything except that it disgraces it or disfigures it. So subhanAllah, if you think about marriage, for any of you who've been married for more than five years, by now you would know that marriage, this, in marriage there's plenty of ups and downs. There's plenty of ups and downs in marriage. There's plenty of trials and hardships that's going to come along your way in your married life. But what can transform your married life into something beautiful despite the hardships is the simplest thing of just being gentle with one another. Try to be more gentle with one another. Doing simple things like purposely trying to smile at each other more. You know, purposely trying to show <clears throat> your care for one another. Trying to be kind. Do kind things for each other. Why? Because you, you're doing it for the sake of Allah. You're doing it for the sake of Allah. And what does Allah say? Inna Allah la yudiru ajr al-muhsineen. Allah does not cause the reward of the muhsineen to ever be lost. Even just asking how are you. Asking. You know, trying to find out. Everybody, all of us want to be cared for. We all want to be cared for. That's what it all comes down to. But... In marriage, if we're not feeling cared for by our spouse, this is half the problem in marriage. That we, we find the root cause of most of our marriage problems is that both spouses don't care, we feel cared from each. They don't feel the care from each other. Subhanallah. So what we all, what we all need to do is to learn to be more gentle with with one another, and to stop putting such pressure on each other as well. Stop putting such expectations on one another, and put more expectations on our own selves. So in conclusion, I want to leave it here by saying, let's not leave tonight asking, because what we tend to do, we go to a topic on marriage and then we go home and what do we do? Why doesn't my spouse treat me better? Like you're all sitting here thinking right now, I like her talk, but guess what? Now I'm thinking about what my husband doesn't do for me and the, the, the men are all thinking what my wife doesn't do for me, right? But let's all leave tonight and start, uh, like rather than we all leave here tonight asking, why doesn't my spouse treat me with better manners, what we should all be doing now if we're sincere with Allah is asking ourselves, how could I 
personally improve my manners in the way I treat my spouse. Because sisters and brothers, you know, let's think about this. This is a problem. We're going to look at things in the big picture. This life is very, very, very short. And ultimately, let me tell you something. The way that you will be remembered by those who are closest to you is through the way you used to speak to those people and the way you used to treat them. That's exactly how you're going to be remembered when you leave this life. So you've got to ask yourself, how do you want to be remembered when you leave this life? How do you want to be remembered? Because that's how you treat people now is exactly how they're going to remember you when you, when you die and leave this life. And then lastly, we need to also ask ourselves, and this is even greater, we have to ask us, you know, we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who's going to ask us about how we used to speak to our spouse. He's going to ask us about every word and, you know, and every action that we did towards our spouses. Allah knows it. We can't hide it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know this in our book of records on Yom Qiyamah, as Allah tells us in Surah Kaf, لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. There's nothing left in a person's book of records. So this is what we should be concerned about. You know, we, we worry about all these other things in our lives, but we should be concerned also and ultimately about the way we treat our spouse. Because when we have strong marriages, my dearest sisters and brothers, this is the, the this is the building stone of the whole ummah. This is the foundation of the whole ummah. Strong marriages is the foundation for a strong ummah, so we all need to be concerned about how we can consolidate our marriages and make our marriages stronger, inshallah. So I'll leave it there. وَقُونُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَسُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدِكَ أَشْلَوَ اللَّهِ إِلَهَا إِلَا أَنْتِ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته